August 12th, 2022. A horrific attack. Famed author Salman Rushdie was stabbed on stage in Western New York early this morning. Author Salman Rushdie has been attacked and stabbed on stage at an event in Western New York. This wasn't a random act of violence or even an isolated freak incident of terrorism. It was decades in the making. More than 30 years later, an international incident thought to be over has reared its head again in the ugliest way imaginable. It culminated in this gruesome attack, but it began in 1988. We accept the rules, we accept the law of this country, but one thing we will not tolerate is the abuse of a religion. This book has, has, has made such an impact that no other book has done in the last century. They can call all the Muslims barbaric and, and insult us as much as they want. But when you take the Prophet and his family, that's when you've crossed the line. This was a flashpoint in British history. A perfect storm amid the growing pains of multiculturalism. Muslim religious authorities deemed Salman Rushdie's new book, The Satanic Verses, a work of blasphemy. The fire spread to all corners of the earth, from Texas to Tokyo. Death threats, riots, and murders. At the center of it all stood Rushdie, a prolific and acclaimed writer. Why did his book inspire such violent opposition? Salman Rushdie was born in Mumbai to a Muslim family in 1947. He grew up in the wake of waning British influence over the Indian subcontinent before moving to the UK as a teenager. If you grow up in a, in a city like Bombay, you grow up with every conceivable kind of religion around you. And, and your friends, certainly my friends, belong to many different religious faiths. The Satanic Verses itself follows the lives of two Indian transplants of Muslim background who live in the UK. The book, released in September 1988, came upon a Britain that had become more multicultural in recent decades, with a small but significant Muslim population for the first time in its history. Many Muslims who spoke against the book believed Rushdie's Muslim background made its blasphemy all the more heinous. The book's title was enough to raise the eyebrows of Muslim authorities. The Satanic Verses referring to an episode in some histories of the Quran where the Prophet Muhammad is said to have heard the voice of God dictate verses to be written into scripture. Verses that allowed a special status of respect for three pagan gods, despite the monotheistic nature of the religion the Prophet was spreading. But he at some later point seems to have gone back up the mountain and come down and said that on the previous occasion the devil had occurred to him in the guise of the Archangel Gabriel who was the normal bringer of the revelation and had tricked him and had brought him verses which were satanic verses not true truly divine revelation and which must be expelled from the Quran. The story is highly controversial for many fundamentalists this invocation in the book's title alone warranted the label of blasphemy. Within the book though the offensive parts of the satanic verses actually only amount to a couple of chapters, consisting of dream sequences in the mind of a character losing his sanity. One of these dream sequences contains a fictionalized portrayal of the life of the Prophet Muhammad, referred to as Mahund. This prophet is portrayed as cynical, dishonest, and unscrupulous. Another objection involved scenes in a brothel or prostitutes bearing the names of the Prophet's wives worked. A storm was brewing in Britain, and it would soon engulf the rest of the world, too. To publish illiterate sacrilege and to try to make money out of it on the excuse that it is a work of great literary merit is not acceptable. The Muslim community in Britain is shocked and outraged beyond any describable measure by the unprecedented enormity of this sacrilege. To slander the saintly personalities of his family and his noble companions, radiallahu anhum, is ta'an fiddeen, and ta'an fiddeen is blasphemy. 
and blasphemy is a capital crime in Islam punishable by death. The UK Action Committee on Islamic Affairs petitioned Viking Penguin to withdraw the book from circulation. The publisher responded that, We don't believe any purpose is ever served in banning books, and certainly not in this case where the book has already been widely circulated and widely praised. Rushdie himself expected a few mullahs would be offended, call me names, and then I could defend myself in public. I was prepared for that. I honestly never expected anything like this. Some Muslim activists proposed seeking legal remedies, but ran into the wall of free speech laws. It's always been this question asked over and over again, what do you think about the death threat? I think this, this must stop and we should concentrate on banning the book and extending the blasphemy laws. This is where deeper fault lines began to emerge. As mass demonstrations unfolded, so too did the controversies spotlight in British media. Then came the book burnings. The first happened in December of 1988, but the one that caught national attention came the following month, in Bradford. To some voices in British media, it was clear-cut. If members of Britain's community of some two million Muslims do not want to read Salman Rushdie's novel The Satanic Verses, all they have to do is abstain from buying it or taking it out of the local library. But there were some, not all of them Muslims, who took a different tone, and argued that freedom of expression, like all freedoms, carries its own responsibilities and conditions. In a civilized society, we try to ensure that right is not abused. These guys behind you are saying they want to kill the guy for what he wrote. Yeah, sure, you, yeah, you can sure. make a reasonable yeah. argument. Rushdie's writing the satanic verses is like a Jew who tries to justify the Holocaust, who defends Hitler's extermination of millions of Jews, and dismisses his crime in light-hearted humor at the expense of the victims of Auschwitz. One Muslim activist went even further. Any Muslim who fails to be offended by Rushdie's book ceases, on account of that fact, to be a Muslim. But this domestic UK news story was about to become international. This had come already in the form of book bans. India was the first, prohibiting the sale of the satanic verses within its borders in October 1988. But everything changed on Valentine's Day 1989. Ayatollah Ruhola Khomeini, the man with the matches and gasoline. A world away from Britain, he had been building a new Iran from the ashes of another. Ten years before the Rushdie affair, his Islamic revolution deposed a US-backed monarchy and remade Iranian society from the top down. It was the end of secularism. But this burgeoning theocracy was still young when Rushdie's book inflamed the Islamic world. It may be that the Ayatollah, an upstart and a Shia to boot, had something to prove in the wake of a firestorm seizing Muslim emotions the world over. Whatever the motivation, the words were unambiguous in the Valentine's Day fatwa, or religious edict. The author of the Satanic Verses, along with all the editors and publishers aware of its contents, are condemned to death. I call on all valiant Muslims, wherever they may be in the world, to kill them without delay. The consequences were immediate. Rushdie had to go into hiding. The TV is full of bloodlust. I'm not at the hotel anymore. I am in this unnameable place. There is weaponry everywhere, and by my side is a panic button that I am to hit if anything worrying happens. This time, the secular reaction was more unified, yet some remained unmoved and called the mainstream reaction hysterical. The anger toward Rushdie persisted. To some, he almost had it coming after what he had written. My personal view is that Perhaps death would be a bit too easy for him to get away with it. But I think his life 
his mind is going to be tormented uh, for the rest of his life as to what he has done, unless he asks for his forgiveness to Almighty Allah. Another participant was the Muslim convert Yusuf Islam, formerly the singer Cat Stevens. He also supported the death sentence on Rushdie. He was asked if he would give him shelter. Yes, I'd, I'd uh, try to phone the uh, Ayatollah Khomeini and tell him exactly where this man is. Would you go to a demonstration where you knew that an effigy was going to be burnt? I would have hoped that it'd be the real thing, but actually, no, if it's just an effigy, I don't think I'd be that moved to go there. Rushdie must have been totally aware of the deep and violent feelings his book would stir up among devout Muslims. In other words, he knew exactly what he was doing, and he cannot plead otherwise. Even former President Jimmy Carter wrote an op-ed for the New York Times entitled, Rushdie's book is an insult. It is our duty to condemn the threat of murder, to protect the author's life and to honor Western rights of publication and distribution. At the same time, we should be sensitive to the concern and anger that prevails even among the more moderate Muslims. While Rushdie's First Amendment freedoms are important, we have tended to promote him and his book with little acknowledgement that it is a direct insult to those millions of Muslims whose sacred beliefs have been violated. To these critics, even if protecting Rushdie from harm was important, it was at least equally important that certain things never be said, even in fiction, so as to protect the dignity of a marginalized minority, or to avoid provoking anger. There were forces at work beneath the surface of this conflict, two competing value systems. In the UK, no one could convincingly argue against freedom of expression. But one could try to argue that it need not protect all kinds of expression. I want that law should be changed, there should be a blasphemy law in this country, and Muslim people should be protected by that. After all, there was a whole range of restrictions on free speech in the UK, such as libel, slander, treason, obscenity, and incitement to racial hatred. It can never be right to defend, in the name of liberalism, works that demean and humiliate human nature and tradition in any of their established forms. Maybe some of this doesn't sound all that unreasonable. But let's step back. If material, demeaning and humiliating human nature, or the foundations of important traditions were not allowed to circulate, where could that possibly end? There is a great deal of difference between freedom of speech and freedom of abuse, freedom of insult, and freedom of provocation. Who gets to decide what falls into those parameters? What would you be allowed to say? And what would it say about a society's confidence in itself if it adopted these standards? It would mean censorship for fear of violence, a society held hostage. Any work of art that caused any offense, for any reason, could be quashed by those who didn't like it. And since suppressive laws are so often weaponized against minorities, Britain's Muslim population would surely be singled out, too. Still, the right to freedom of expression also means the freedom to speak against that right. And so we should ask, did some of these activists actually have a point? When the Satanic Verses first made its rounds and some activists went to court for recourse, they wanted to charge Rushdie with blasphemy. It seemed possible because blasphemy laws were still on the books in the UK in 1989, but they applied only to blasphemy against Christianity. A law cannot be confined only to one particular religion or one particular faith. A law to be a law has to be universal. The UK Action Committee on Islamic Affairs wrote to Minister of State John Patton that the crisis over the Satanic Verses refuses to go away for the perfectly understandable reason that our legal framework does not envisage a situation in which an offense of sacrilege could be committed against religions other than the Anglican faith. The minister echoed the government's conclusion that it would be unwise to expand the law of blasphemy. 
by this point in Britain's history, the blasphemy law was antiquated, rarely invoked, if ever. But the country's Christian roots had left it as a holdover, even into the late 20th century. If Anglicans could at least theoretically have their day in court for offenses against Christ, can one blame Muslims for desiring their own? What we demand is a change in law to protect our religion. What we demand is the same right as the Christians. And we are going to lobby the members of parliament to pass a bill so that the law of blasphemy can be strengthened so that it will enable us to proceed in course of law to have this book banned permanently and to prevent the publication of such blasphemous books in future. One of the reasons Minister Patton cited against expanding the blasphemy law was the clear lack of agreement over whether the law should be reformed or repealed. To committed secularists, repeal is the clear answer, one that has now been implemented in most of the UK. But far from being an answer that satisfies everyone, this only sharpens the fault line between secularism and militant faith. To the UK Action Committee, unequal treatment in law wasn't the heart of the issue at all. It is not our position that if Islamic sanctities are not protected against sacrilege, then the existing protection of the Anglican faith should also be removed. The heart of the issue was instead a sincerely held belief that religious convictions, especially for Abrahamic faiths like Christianity and Islam, deserved more deference than the right to free speech, that they deserved special protection from criticism with the full force of the law. Repealing blasphemy laws meant a solidification of secular values, which to these religious activists was far more unacceptable than an unevenly applied blasphemy law. The Ayatollah died only a short four months after he issued his decree, but his words didn't die with him. Assassins complied with his directive. Ettore Capriolo, the Italian translator of the Satanic Verses, was stabbed in an attempted murder, but survived. Aziz Nassin, the Turkish translator, also suffered an attempt on his life. Norwegian translator William Nygaard was shot three times. The book's Japanese translator, Professor Hitoshi Igarashi, was murdered outside his university office. All this on top of the riots, terrorist attacks, and general mayhem that followed the book's release, including the firebombing of two London bookstores. Dozens perished amid this violence. Rushdie made many attempts to reconcile with the global Muslim community. I profoundly regret the distress that publication has occasioned to sincere followers of Islam. At one point, he even claimed reconversion to Islam, hoping that this would calm the waters. It didn't. Much as Muhammad is said to have renounced the verses the devil planted in his mind, Rushdie later renounced this conversion, revealing that it had only been an attempt to ensure his physical safety. This feigned embrace of religion would become one of Rushdie's greatest regrets from this period in his life, about which he later wrote a memoir named after the pseudonym he used in those years, Joseph Anton. In 1998, the new Iranian president, Mohammad Khatami, declared Khomeini's fatwa no longer in effect, seeming to end the immediate threat to the author's life. But this was only temporary. Seven years later, the fatwa was declared alive and well by Iranian religious authorities. Officially, it will never be lifted. Still, Rushdie wouldn't stay in hiding forever. For more than two decades, he lived a normal life, now in the United States. He was even knighted by the British government in 2007 for his literary achievements. There were some grumbles about insensitivity from some of the usual suspects, but on the whole, in addition to being a recognition of his work as an author, it was a signal of retrospective solidarity, 
a formal declaration that the UK had sided with Rushdie against the fundamentalists. For many years, the Rushdie affair appeared to be over. Yet, political and social reverberations of the event echoed through the world still. Uh, would, you say the, the, would you say the response was appropriate and proportionate? Oh, e easily, easily. But I, I think we could have, could have done a lot more. It was a worldwide, worldwide response as well, starting in the UK. Mm -hmm. And we're still angry about it. What do you think the, the legacy is of, of what you did here with the book? The government didn't listen. The book is still there. What did it did do is to raise awareness about the feelings of Muslims in the community so that the community of other authors don't write similar book about Muslims we end up in a similar situation again. So by burning one book, we, what we did was to promote peace at that time. The fault line is exposed again and again. Sometimes it was accusations of blasphemy like Rushdie faced. Other times, controversies erupted over the portrayal of the Prophet Muhammad in cartoons. Whatever the superficial details of each case, it always came back to the same conflict of principle, the right to free expression against the breaching of religious precepts. The drama played out again with the same pattern in 2005 and 2006. A Danish newspaper, Jyllands Posten, published a series of cartoons depicting the Prophet Muhammad, an enormous taboo in Islam. It was to trigger a conversation about free expression, and in some ways it accomplished this goal, not least because of the crisis that followed. Muslim activists demanded legal remedies for the blasphemous cartoons. The Danish government wouldn't budge. Riots and violence followed. In 2007, Swedish artist Lars Vilks found himself in a predicament similar to Rushdie's. He had drawn and published his own Muhammad cartoons and paid with attempts on his life. Terrorist attacks motivated by this transgression continued in the years that followed. Another flashpoint came in 2015, the Charlie Hebdo attacks. More than a dozen dead because a magazine had dared to print a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. To the murderers, it was not free expression. It was sacrilege. Would Ayatollah Khomeini have seen it any differently? In the last two years, teachers covering this shooting in classrooms faced reprimands and retribution for displaying the cartoons themselves. In the UK, a religions teacher at Batley Grammar School was forced into hiding and suspended from his post after showing the Charlie Hebdo cartoons as part of a lesson on the concept of blasphemy. A controversy which lasted months ensued as Muslim parents protested the display. The teacher was ultimately allowed to return to his post after an investigation found he did not intend to cause offense. But the investigators also stipulated that using the image did cause deep offense to a number of students, parents, and members of our school community. The topics covered by the lesson could have been effectively addressed in other ways. In 2020, in France, school teacher Samuel Paty committed the same offense, showing the Charlie Hebdo cartoons as part of a lesson on free expression. He asked Muslim students who would find them offensive to cover their eyes. And he was beheaded in broad daylight on a residential street. From French President Emmanuel Macron, the response here was more resolute Nous pas aux caricatures, aux dessins, même si d'autres reculent. In one case, a doomed attempt to accommodate the idea that religious sensibilities must never be offended with secularism. In the other, a recognition that freedom to worship must also mean the freedom to blaspheme. And then, of course, the latest attempt to fulfill the dead Ayatollah's command, 33 years after it was issued. As recently as a few weeks before the fateful attack, Rushdie spoke about how the threat of the fatwa continued to affect his life. 
or more accurately, how it didn't at all. His life, he said, was relatively normal, and he no longer lived in fear of an attack. This was the posture he took in the decades following the affair, that terrorism relied on fear, and so the only way you can defeat it is by deciding not to be afraid. On August 12th at the Chautauqua Institute in New York, Rushdie was about to give a talk on artistic freedom, specifically how the United States has served as a kind of asylum for free expression. It's a tragic irony that the most grievous attempt on his life yet took place in this setting. With the amphitheater, the presenter was just attacked on the stage on EDMF. In the aftermath, investigators learned more about the attacker, 24-year-old Hadi Matar. He had Shiite extremist sympathies, including with the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps of Iran. He had physically trained for combat in the months prior to his attack. He had legally purchased a ticket to the event. It was a gruesome assault. Rushdie was stabbed at least ten times, including in the abdomen and neck. The knife punctured his liver and one of his eyes, which he appeared likely to lose. Thanks to police and bystanders, Matar was restrained. Rushdie's life saved. Rushdie was airlifted to a hospital where he underwent surgery for hours. But his injuries, though very serious, were not fatal. He was off his ventilator two days after the attack and, as his agent put it, on the road to recovery. Matar didn't succeed in taking Rushdie's life, but he cast the dark pall of the fatwa back over it. As recently as a few weeks ago, the Rushdie affair was thought to be over, a past event. But it's clear now that it's never been over, only dormant. This latest act of bloodlust is only the tip of a serrated knife. What the Rushdie affair really did was lay bare one of the most consequential conflicts roiling liberal societies in the last half century. The Yulens Posten controversy, the attacks on Lars Vilks, the Charlie Hebdo murders, the attempt on Rushdie's life, all tell the same story. Religion refusing to reconcile with liberalism. This isn't poised to go away if we only give it more time. Younger European Muslims are identifying more, not less, with Islam. The expectation that younger generations would become more secular hasn't come to pass. In this environment, future attacks as grisly as the one Rushdie just suffered are not just likely, they're all but guaranteed. In the wake of this violent renewal of an attack on free expression that began more than 30 years ago, liberal societies have a choice to make. For decades, Salman Rushdie has refused to be cowed by fear, even while the threat of death followed him. Will the leaders of liberal societies follow his example? All those who value freedom of expression and conscience should hope and demand as much.